Hello, and welcome to this Agilent Technologies recorded webcast. We hope you will find this webcast both interesting and valuable. If after viewing this recording you are interested in more, please go to our Agilent TM webcast YouTube channel for more recordings, or sign up for one of the upcoming live sessions at www.agilent.com slash find slash web underscore seminars. Now, let's get, go over to the presenter. Thank you all for uh, coming today, and I know everyone is busy. I'm really excited to have you joining us here because calibration is, uh, I represent Agilent on the standards committees, uh, which generally speaking are meeting in, in the Americas, but we also have uh, good representation and many guests coming in from UK and other parts of Europe. Um, so I've gotten to know some of those people, and whenever I'm representing Agilent, I work closely with some of the people that we have in Agilent uh, in the UK, Germany, uh, Italy, et cetera. So I'm excited to talk to you today about calibration. Um, <clears throat> so as Luca just told you or mentioned, um, we have a number of topics here, and today I'm going to cover the first three of those topics, and then next time we'll be talking about traceability and standards compliance, and then there's a third one which will be uh, devoted entirely to accreditation. Now, each of these, uh, each of or the first three of these, are also available um, as YouTube videos. I'm obviously going to make uh, some additional comments beyond the limited time that we had in the YouTube ones. But we wanted to mention that these are available. Presently, they're available in English, but they're also going to be coming up, I think, later this month. They're also going to be translated to, to many local languages as well. So I wanted to tell you about that. And then, as Luca was just mentioning, um, you, you may have noticed uh, when you signed up for this webcast that there were several additional ones coming. And so uh, just to tell you that <clears throat> the traceability and standards compliance will be coming in December, and then in January we will be doing, um, we will dedicate a webcast to accreditation. Now before I get into the specifics on calibration, I just I'll, whenever I'm live with an audience, and I, send, I consider this close to being live, well, it is live, it's just not, and you just don't see me personally. I like to say a few words about philosophy, because I think it's important whenever you're talking about measurements. So, for 60 years, Hewlett Packard tested measurement, the passion at HP, and I, and I was an HP employee for 20 more than 20 years, the passion was always accurate measurements. And then in 2001, we became Agile in Technologies, and I'm happy to report that um, our passion is still accurate measurements. Now, you may have heard, sometimes you'll see uh, in marketing material that Agile is the premier measurement company. And I know it sounds good, but one thing I'd like to just tell you is, as a metrologist, and as an engineer who knows many of the other top engineers in the, co in the company, I can tell you from personal experience that whenever there's a question about how should we do something, my favorite comment is always, well, customers would expect the premier measurement company to do the following. And you know, I've never lost an argument. So, and I've never seen anybody else either. So we, my point is, we really do, when we say that, we live it. it we really mean it. And last, and then this is the end of the commercial here, uh, last I'd like to tell you that when we're doing um, calibration or repair, our passion there is the same. It's accurate measurements. So we like to think that people buy our instruments because you want accurate measurements, and when you trust to send it back to us for service, our passion is to make sure that uh, the only difference between your passion for measurements and ours is that you're measuring uh, a device or process of your own and we're measuring the instrument that you gave us back. So anyway, I just want to kind of 
when you hear me talking, you may hear some of that passion come through. I don't mind if it comes through because it's, it's, it's what we're all about. All right. So let's dive into why calibrate? Why calibrate at all? Is it just a necessary evil? So there are different levels and different uh, attitudes and use cases that uh, m many customers of ours have towards calibration. And probably the first level is, well, we need it to meet ISO 9001. And that's important because everybody needs to meet ISO 9001. However, you may know if you've ever read through ISO 9001 carefully, you may know that there's only one paragraph in there on calibration, and all it says is that you have to uh, perform calibration. So the idea then is, you know, really that is, that's a fairly simple requirement to meet. It doesn't, doesn't really talk about most of the things that I'm going to get into that ensure measurement integrity. Now, a second level that we oftentimes hear, and I'm happy to report many times from European customers, is you want to validate that your design or that your manufacturing processes are under statistical control and when you've established a system error budget that, that um, you are operating within that system error budget. This is where standards like ISO 17025 or uh, later on, when we talk about measurement uncertainty, the, the ISO Guide for Expression of Uncertainty of Measurement, this is where those standards come in, is for item number two. And finally, there are uh, ministries of defense uh, type applications, where oftentimes what we hear about that is that they want to make sure that the armed forces never have a bad day. And my apologies on short notice, I could not find a Eurofighter art that would uh, slide in from the left. So um, I know that that's not a Eurofighter, but I couldn't find one. Okay, now let's just take a look again as a pre preliminary question. When you go to buy an instrument, whether it's from Agilent or even if it's from somebody else, how do you choose which instrument you're going to buy? I like to ask this question whenever I'm talking to an audience like yourselves because um, in many cases we have quite a few model numbers. So I'm showing, a I'm showing a table that you might very well see if you went onto the Agilent web for spectrum analyzers. And in this case it's showing 29 models and I did this a while ago, there's over 30 now. So how do you decide which of those 30 models you're going to pick? Well, obviously nobody wants to spend more, more money than they have to. So what most customers tell me is that uh, what you do is you carefully analyze the specifications in a table, something like this, and you determine which of the specifications that your organization needs to have. And once you've determined which specifications you have to have, then it's a fairly simple matter to go on to the table and decide, okay, which instrument has those specifications and is the least expensive that will meet that job. That's how most people select an instrument. So the reason I wanted to point this out to you is just to reinforce that when you buy instruments, you're counting on certain key specifications for your organization. I hope that's not a surprise, and I'm, I'm sure that's, that's something that's, that's fairly obvious to you. So the whole reason I mentioned this is the, uh, is the question about, okay, if you're relying on those, those specifications when you buy the instrument, what about the next year or five years or perhaps even beyond? Will you still rely on those same specifications? The answer is you probably will. So if that's true, that's why calibration matters. So before I get into a definition of, uh, so what is calibration, I oftentimes, especially when I'm in, in person, 
I like to ask folks, when you send an instrument for calibration to an outside lab, Agilent or anybody else, what exactly do you expect them to do? So I'd like you to think about this for just a second. Now, a lot of times what I will hear is after a pause, somebody will say, well, test it. And also I'll say, okay, test it to what? And eventually someone says, well, to the specification. And then I like to ask them, okay, which specifications? And then people think about that a little bit further. And after a little bit, someone usually says, uh, all of them? And so, okay, all of them, fine. And then what I like to ask is, if they didn't mention it, what do you expect them to do if they find that the instrument is out of specification? And then people will normally say, um, adjust it. So just like to have you thinking about some of that, and now we're going to go dive into some formal definitions and kind of talk about um, some of the elements and the key deliverables with calibration. Now, if you look, uh, here is an operating definition for calibration where we, <clears throat> you see a gentleman there, he's, he's doing some work. Um, it's, the definition is to verify instrument specifications by measuring the actual performance using external lab standards, normally instruments, that in turn have better performance than what you're trying to measure and also are traceable to the International System of Units via national metrology labs like NPL in the UK or NRC in Canada or NIST in, in the US, et cetera. There's, there's many of them in each of the countries. Okay, that's a bit of a mouthful. And I'm hoping that many of you on the call are engineers, not necessarily metrologists. And I'm actually an engineer at heart, too. I'm an electrical engineer. Um, <clears throat> and it was only after I studied the, the standards and began representing Agilent that I now call myself also a metrologist. So I think there's a much easier way to understand what is calibration. And here it is. This is what, this is what we say. At Agilent, we measure the actual performance of every warranted specification for every installed option and we do that every time. Every spec, every option, every time. It's that simple. And it's actual performance. So <clears throat> this is probably a good point for me to mention. Many times I will hear people that are in that first use case where all they're attempting to achieve is ISO 9001, they'll say, oh, well, we're getting calibration functional tests, so that's, that's what we have. Functional tests do not test the actual performance. Let me give you an example, uh, a non-technical example. Suppose you have your car in and you're getting the oil changed, and they also check your brakes. Paul? Um, yes. Sorry, sorry if I interrupt you. I'm getting messages on the question and answer line that we have lost the audio. Oh. Um, Katie, is there any, oh Patrick, is there any way that we can check if this is a general problem? I uh, may ask people who are attending the call to just um, type in the Q&A box if, um, if you can still hear us. Um, look at the audio, uh, streaming is fine. I, I, I believe it's a, an individual thing and it can be very easily solved uh, in many cases by just stopping and restarting the audio broadcast. Okay, perfect. Okay, thanks for everyone who are confirming that the audio is fine. Thank you a lot. So Bob, please carry on and I will, um, I will send a note to those people who are having issues to dial in again and uh, that should probably resolve it. Thanks, Bob. Sorry okay. for the interruption. So continue then? Yes, please. Okay, sorry. Thank you, Luca. Um, so I was just about to give an example of a functional check and uh, if, it was just saying if you take your personal auto and you take it in uh, and it's having service, a functional check on your brakes would be, uh, an example would be where somebody drives around the block, um, you tap the brakes with your foot and as long as you don't hear any noise you say, oh, they're fine. 
So an actual performance of what, if, if someone checks my brakes, they had better use a caliper and they had better tell me how many millimeters of brake pad I have in the front, on the side, and in the back. That's, what, that's a real test. Then I can determine if I want to go on a long trip, say to the south of France or somewhere nice like that, then I know that my car, if I'm starting out and driving on a long trip, that I'll ha I won't have to worry about my brakes, at least until I get back. So here's an example of <clears throat> one of our higher performance spectrum analyzers, and you see a list of 43 performance tests. So what we do when we, uh, is in the course of bringing out a new instrument, um, when we're characterizing that new instrument to see what specifications we can provide, at the same time during that new product introduction process, we have metrologists looking at, okay, how can we develop uh, appropriate performance tests using appropriate instruments such that we can measure that actual performance, both in production and later on in service centers. And that's how each of these uh, performance tests become defined as this is what it takes to measure the actual performance of any uh, instrument which you find warranted on a on a data sheet. Now uh, what we're going to do is uh, is an actual example um, on one of our RF signal generators here um, and which one isn't, isn't really so important. It's really, in this case, which of the tests are key. And so what you will see is <clears throat> uh, looking along the, on the left-hand side here, we have two cases. And this was an actual case where we had an Agilent uh, service center did a report, and then there was an outside lab. And so you can see each of them did the output power and then we're going to see as we move along for each of the tests, you'll see uh, little green dots if those tests were performed. And if you see dots along the top but you don't see any on the bottom, what that means is that in that case that, that particular test was not performed. So here's the point that I'd like to make is that if you are using an instrument and any one of the performance specifications that's circled in yellow there is important, then basically that, 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 that particular performance of the instrument was, was not checked. And therefore, you don't really know uh, if your instrument is in specification or not. So now I'd like to switch, role, uh, switch thoughts just a little bit and ask you, in your organization or company, who is responsible for the accuracy of measurements? Well, there's many choices here, and many people are doing different things inside of an organization. There's procurement people, there's engineering, and certainly there's management. And obviously, all of those roles are very important to impact overall business results. But what I'm really asking is, if you are responsible for test systems, then it probably comes as no surprise that you're also responsible for the accuracy of measurements. And if you've never thought about it, part of that responsibility for the accuracy of measurements is calibration. Now, I know I've got a master's degree in electrical engineering, and I can tell you that no professor ever told me anything about calibration. So when I was doing labs and using instruments, I always assumed they were perfect. And unfortunately, that's not quite true. Even, even today's modern instruments with their advanced block diagrams do drift. And it's important to, and I'm going to give you an example or two later when I get to one of the later slides of how that can happen and, and an example of why that can be a problem. So what I want to leave you with this thought at this early point is that if you are that person who's responsible for test systems, 
then if all you're doing is turning your instruments in to somebody else and say, please get this calibrated, and you're assuming that good things are happening and that the performance of all the specifications is, is happening, that may or may not be happening. So if you own responsibility for measurements, then I urge you to get involved and to trust, but verify that the specs that you're counting on have been measured accurately. Okay, so you might ask, well, how do I do that? And you know, it's really pretty simple. Um, <clears throat> with calibration, you should receive a measurement report. And the performance tests that um, we design at Agilent for our instruments line up exactly with the specifications that you'd find on an instrument data sheet. So what you can do is look at a measurement report and identify that perhaps you already know for a particular instrument what are the key specifications that you're relying on, and you can go look in your measurement report and see how that's done. Now, if you're already a, a customer with Agilent Technologies and you're doing, uh, if we're doing the calibration for you, then you may know that um, we put the results of every instrument that we measure in calibration, we post those on the Internet um, so that if you have a logon and a password, you can go access those at any time. And a lot of customers tell us they really like this when they're doing um, quality audits, when the uh, assessor says, uh, show me proof of calibration for this instrument. You can go online and, uh, and grab that and show that to them, and it, and, it, and it makes that very easy. Now, I do want to give you a little word of caution. Sometimes people will tell me, oh, well, I don't need a measurement report because my supplier gives me an out-of-tolerance report. If something's out-of-tolerance, they tell me. Okay, what I, my personal response to that is the only, the, a measurement report is really physical evidence that, that actual work was performed. So if you can look at a measurement report and see all of the measurements, then you know what was actually done. If someone tells you out of tolerance, for example, if they told me in the case of the car, your brakes are fine, but if I don't know how thick the brake pads are, then I really don't know if it was measured or not. If you tell me how thick the brake pads were, then I know exactly that you did the test and um, I have a good idea as to how much longer I can drive that vehicle before I'm going to have to um, have, have some additional work done. So I'm going to shift gears now to the second topic in our series, and that's calibration adjustments. Now what I'd like to do here is when in this is a block diagram that I've put together um, because what I found was that I myself was not aware of the way this, of this particular flow, even as an engineer inside of Agilent Technologies and HP. And I found in many cases that some of our customers were not aware of that too. Many people think that with calibration uh, that adjustments are performed every time an instrument is sent in for calibration. And that's not true. What really happens for calibration, whether it's from Agilent or someone else, is that a series of performance tests are run, and then if you pass those, you're done. It's that simple. So if you weren't already aware of that, I wanted to make, make clear that, that you did understand that. Now, if the some of the tests are not passed, in other words, the measured performance is outside of the specification, that's when we run adjustments. And when you run adjustments, if those are successful, then you loop back and you rerun any performance tests that could have been affected by adjusting that particular portion of the block diagram. And then if you pass, you're done. And that is why um, if you look at ISO 17025, it calls for uh, <clears throat> giving the end customer the results um, 
of bef before and after you do adjustments. Those are called out. Now at Agilent, we we don't we, we do that partly because 17025 calls for that, but we do it really just because it's the right thing to do. Um, we know that you may want to go back and do some analysis if something was out of tolerance. You may want to say, hmm, you would like to know if it was out of tolerance, how far, and then afterwards, um, what is the actual performance? So that if there's some uh, if some possibility that a portion of production um, needs to be reinvestigated for any reason, you're able to do that. So at Agilent, we always do that regardless of which which calibration service you select. So I'll go to the next slide. Here's an easy way to maybe understand what's happening. Um, this particular example is a uh, high-performance digital voltmeter, and what we've done is taken one of the measurements, in this case for ohms, and we've normalized it so that we can show it on a chart like this. And as we step across, you can see that over time, that instrument does drift, and at a certain point, it's actually out of specification. So then at that point, when you perform adjustments, um, it's brought back into specification, and then it's on a new um, drift trajectory. So as I was just mentioning uh, when we were going through the block diagram, um, what we do at Agilent is we will always give you, uh, this, this is showing you the summary. So this says in this particular case, uh, this is for, I guess, a signal generator, that one of the tasks as received initially failed, and then we would perform adjustments, and then as completed, everything passed. Now, of course, in the full data here, you would get uh, all of the data that's associated with this, both for the failed result and for the new past result. All right. So now uh, let's just show you, um, at the same time in uh, new product introductions, when we're developing the, um, <clears throat> the performance test, we also develop the internal adjustments. And here's an example for one of our um, microwave uh, spectrum analyzers. Uh, and you can see in this particular case that it has 22 different adjustments. Now, I just want to make a quick comment. Um, it's probably been more than 15 years. I don't know the exact amount, but I know it's more than 15 years since we last had a screwdriver potentiometer adjustment inside of an instrument. And um, the, if, if you look at the actual specifications over time of uh, how much they've improved from, from, say, 20 years ago, many of those uh, improvements are due to the way that we now do adjustments. So here's, here's a, uh, a shot of uh, a technician who's doing adjustments on one of our microwave signal generators. And you see a couple things. First of all, he's using a lot of external equipment. So it isn't so much, you know, adjust the voltage at node XYZ until you see 3.4 volts. Now, now, in order to make sure that an instrument is operating properly, these adjustments are now automated. Um, they use external equipment, uh, generally the exact same equipment that's used for the performance tests. Um, so they're not only automated, but they can go back and forth, and they're iterative. So depending on what the algorithm finds, it may branch to a different portion of the block diagram, adjust something else, and then and move back around. And so, for example, on, on output power level, sometimes that may very well take 30 or 40 minutes. Now, fortunately, the technician doesn't have to be there the whole time, but that whole time, in an automated fashion, the instrument is being adjusted um, through different portions of the block diagram. 20 years ago, it was the best we could do for uh, RF output level down near, say, minus 110 dBm would be plus or minus 2 dB. Nowadays, you find many of our generators are less than 0.5 dB and even lower than that at the RF frequencies. This is how we get that uh, type of performance. Now I want to talk a little bit about repair. 
So if you uh, failed one of the performance tests and in addition you were not able to successfully run the adjustments, what that means is that your instrument is broken. And I want to have just a little fun uh, in Spanish. Uh, este instrumento está quebrado, or my more favorite word, descompuesto. And I understand that in Italian you would say something like questo strumento è rotto. Now I'm not going to say anything in French because it's horrible to have such a beautiful language um, with an American accent and I just can't get rid of mine, so pardon me for no French. But I will do one last one. My very favorite for broken is, is auf Deutsch, and that is es kaput. I think we all know what kaput means. So if your instrument is kaput, meaning it got to the right-hand side of the block diagram here, then the first thing you have to do is to run diagnostics to figure out, okay, what failed. And then obviously you need parts. I'm going to show that to you in a minute. But also, once you install those parts, the very first thing you want to do is run adjustments then you now rerun the performance tests, and if you then pass, you've not only repaired it, but you now um, are ready for reuse. So let's look at where those parts, an example. So, you know, here's an example of parts, and I just wanted to show you in one of our parts depots, it looks something like this. So you get an idea that <clears throat> uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you one more picture. This is a shot of our one in, uh, in Sacramento, California, in the United States. But we also have uh, similar parts depots um, just outside of Frankfurt in Germany as well. And so whenever an instrument needs to be repaired, um, the reason why we have all these parts is so that um, when a technician says, okay, this is what I need, uh, you see there on the left-hand side, that box can get to that technician uh, well under half an hour, oftentimes as fast as 20 minutes. So um, the reason why we maintain, we have over 25,000 parts for all of the different instruments that we have in those centers. And the reason why we maintain all that, of course, is so that um, we can minimize the turnaround time for you. Now, I just want to say one other thing. Um, most non-OEM labs um, are not in a position to provide adjustments. So a lot of times a third party, um, if they are making the measurements, uh, they may very well say, well, that instrument needs to be repaired. What we find at Agilent is that oftentimes when such instruments are referred to us, they don't need new parts. All they need is adjustments. Now, I do want to mention also that um, for some of our newer instruments, we have made available uh, calibration, automated calibration software, which, among other things, includes adjustments, and that's for only over 170 instruments. So here's a list, briefly, uh, of all of those instruments. So you can see most of them are RF and microwave. But sometimes what we hear people tell us is, oh, yeah, we use the Agilent software. Well, what I want you to understand is that's great if they are, um, and we do make these available on a per-use basis to anybody who wants them. Um, but one thing you should understand is that the only way you can run those adjustments is, is if you have the appropriate equipment. And um, like I told you about the uh, functional test on your brake pads, um, I believe what I know to be true. So you should know that if someone tells you that they're using the Agilent N7800 software, then it is um, then you should also be receiving an Adobe Ac Acrobat file, which is the measurement report, and that's your physical proof that that software was used. So we do make this available for about 170 of our 2,000 or more instruments. For all the rest of those, um, those are just generally not uh, made available um, just because those tools were, are, are using older software platforms and it's, it's uh, difficult to s support some of those older ones for, uh, for customer use. 
Um, if you go on the Agilent website, uh, you can g learn more about adjustments. We have a uh, uh, two-page um, literature piece that describes more about this, and I have a note down there at the bottom. Okay, enough about adjustments. Now I want to talk to you about measurement uncertainty. And you know, this is a, when I'm in the standards committees, we spend a tremendous amount of time and energy on measurement uncertainty. And I know what some of you are thinking. What the heck is measurement uncertainty? And again, I, so I've, I've come up with this diagram because unless you're a metrologist, no one, no engineers talk about measurement uncertainty. We would talk about accuracy. But I can show you on this diagram easily in a way that even our mothers could tell us what's a pass and what's a fail. So if you were to draw this diagram and you look at the top at the, at the red dot, you have a two-sided specification and anybody can say, well, that's out of spec, that's a fail. And I look at the second data point here and I say, oh, that's inside, that's a pass. The question is, what do you do when you have a measurement that's just barely inside the specification? Then you say, hmm, that's a little trickier because we all know that uh, there is no such thing as an absolute true measurement. So every measurement has some amount of um, statistical variation uh, based on a number of factors, the accuracy of the instruments, the measurement technique, et cetera. And so what I've drawn here is a yellow interval. So if you were able to express the uh, standard deviation about a measurement point, you would have something like this, this interval here. And so you can see a portion of that standard, uh, a portion of that yellow interval extends outside of the specification. And so if your true answer is there, obviously that means that the instrument is really out of specification. All right, so now I'm going to go to the formal definition. You can go to the international vocabulary. This is something that if, if you're interested, you can go get it uh, right off the web. It's, it's uh, the World Wide Web. It's free. And the official definition of uncertainty of measurement is that it is a parameter associated with the result of a measurement that characterizes the dispersion of values that could be reasonably attributed to the measurand. Okay, measurand is really just metrology speak for the measurement. And when you hear the word dispersion, you're probably thinking, hmm, that sounds like statistics. And it is. Let me give you the simple way of thinking about this. How accurate is the measurement? That's what this is about. Um, I oftentimes, uh, when I first joined the standards committees, I asked one of the other people, what's the difference between accuracy and measurement and third uncertainty? And several of the uh, old timers there thought, oh my gosh, this guy's an idiot. Well, ho hopefully I'm not. But what they didn't understand is that as an engineer, I was used to developing a system accuracy by evaluating a measurement, and I would look closely at the accuracy of the key specs of any instruments involved, then I would decide which of those accuracy contributions uh, mattered. I would weight them. If they were dependent or interdependent, I would factor that in. I would combine them into an equation. So for example, when we were doing satellite payload test systems, this is what we regularly did. So then, well, what does a metrologist do when they're looking at measurements, say, in an instrument? Well, it turns out they do exactly the same thing. The only difference is they have a totally different vocabulary. They talk about ISO 17025, or in this case, in terms of instrument accuracy, they talk about the ISO Guide for Expression of Uncertainty of Measurements. Now, for the rest of our time here, for a few more minutes, we're going to talk today about the ISO Guide for Expression of Uncertainty of Measurement. And next time, I'm going to talk about some of those other key specs. But the thing I want you to know now is that unless you have an internal Cal Lab, you probably don't have someone with a title of metrologist. But you probably do have many engineers, and I want you to be certain 
that those engineers are doing the exact same job as a metrologist. They just don't know it. So let's look at an example here. You know, if you look at the steps to determine um, measurement uncertainty, it's just what I was mentioning a moment ago. You analyze the sources of error, you develop a measurement equation, you combine those errors for the guidelines, and then, of course, you validate. Um, if you're interested in reading more about this, um, I'm showing here um, a document which you can download from the UK, um, uh, the UCAS accreditation body, uh, and this is my favorite link because it happens to be free. Um, so, uh, and the other reason I like it a lot is that it has some very nice examples. So let's look at those steps. Um, step one, I'm going to give you just a simple, give you an idea of, of what's involved. Um, one of the specifications for power sensor is linearity. And you have an equation there that shows what that is. And that's really, as I indicate in the text there, it's just the difference between the relative power change of a known change versus so what do you measure? Well, in order to do this, um, <clears throat> and this is something I think we have an application note on, um, what you use is a directional coupler, uh, and you model the incident power, and then you also use S parameters so that you can express the various levels at the different ports of the coupler. Then you use the uncertain equation from the ISO guide where uh, each of the variables is defined. And I know you can't really see this, but it turn, if, you, if you look at that uh, equation at the bottom there that looks pretty detailed, that's the actual equation that we implement in software when with, with each, which each of those uh, replaced by the appropriate coefficients. That is the actual equation when you're doing this particular power uh, sensor linearity. That's the measurement uncertainty associated with that. So you can see why we want to use automated procedures. You certainly wouldn't want to do this with a calculator. Now, when you look at an actual example uh, on a printout, you're going to see just a number or something on a chart. So I just want you to remember that the, what I was just showing you a moment ago is what it really takes to put that to properly calculate that number. Um, now, I'm just uh, as you look at the different uh, standards that are um, that are appearing on the chart here, um, <clears throat> and again, we're going to go into a little bit more detail on these in the, in the next webcast. But the key point I want to make here is that today, whether you're looking at ISO 17025. Uh, or thinking about the compliance with specification according to ILAC G8, uh, or any of those uh, current standards, every single one of them makes references to using the ISO guide for expression of uncertainty and measurement, every single one. And let me show you why it matters. So this is one of our last slides here, but I think it's perhaps maybe one of the most important. I'm going to show you two different examples. So think of this as calibration lab A and calibration lab B. It doesn't matter who A and B are. They're just two labs. So they're measuring the same instrument, and they get the same result. So we could say, oh, the instrument passed. We're good to go for another year. Let's put it back into production. We're fine to go. And you might ask, well, is that, is that everything I should know? Well, let me show you in my example here the measurement uncertainty associated with that. I'm showing two different examples here. One of them uh, has a, the A has a much smaller uh, me uh, measurement uncertainty than B. And if we show that <clears throat> we have, uh, if, if we show the interval for the 95% expanded uncertainty interval, this means two standard deviations. Um, then what you can say is of a population, the 95% coverage interval would be uh, in the white brackets there. Okay, now what exactly does this mean? Well, what it means is, is that the area in red, either with A there's a small area and there's a much larger area in B, if the true result of the measurement is anywhere in the area that's shown in red, 
it means that you're really outside of specification. Now, I'm just looking at the time. I can't really go into examples, but I want you to know that this is something which absolutely happens, um, uh, can happen, and does. And we see variations. Um, when I look at comparisons of test reports, I see variations at least this large. And I'll just say, if we were looking at a signal generator at a low power level, say around one microvolt, which is where you measure sensitivity, then it's very possible that if you're using an older spectrum analyzer with an analog log amplifiers and analog uh, filters um, for a new signal generator that has a tight specification, you very well could have an uncertainty over on the right-hand side, whereas the new ones with the digital IFs would correspond to the left. So here's something that I want you to think about now and perhaps after the broadcast. The actual instrument accuracy that you can depend on in your organization is only as good as the expanded uncertainty of your last calibration. Now, recently I was in a large public venue at the NCLSI conference, and a customer saw this one on the right, and they said, well, now, how do you do adjustments on that one if the situation is on the right? <laughs> and you can probably guess the answer. You can't, because you don't even really know where the true answer is, so you certainly can't use that for adjustments. So, again, that's another reason why you want to have that be. Now, at Agilent, we feel that measurement uncertainty is so important that we've been doing it ever since 1996 when the ISO Guide for Expression of Uncertainty was first published. And you see here in Europe, I've just circled two of, the, uh, two of our services where we report the uncertainties to you. Um, and uh, one last, and perhaps the last slide, I'd like to show you uh, now and then if, if we have a, an instrument um, which, again, is close to the upper specification, that little area in red represents a small probability that the instrument may very well be out of spec. Uh, we have a very prominent customer in Sweden who makes base stations, and they are always telling us that um, they're very clear that they it's, it's a very expensive proposition to have a technician go up 50 or 75 meters above the ground and try to do service on that base station. So when they're measuring the sensitivity of one of those base stations, they want to be absolutely clear that it's going to be fine. And so what they, they're one of the people who actually asked us for Agilent Cal plus uncertainties plus guard banning. What we do for that particular service um, <clears throat> uh, is that we guard band in other words, we use a tighter limit for setting adjustments, which is in the amount of the expanded measurement uncertainty. And when you do that, you end up with something like this, where after we have performed that adjustment, um, even with the associated expanded uncertainty, it's well within the guaranteed specification. So that represents, if you consider the risk of having an instrument, say, pass when, in fact, it really failed, this particular option is the lowest, um, uh, lowest risk for making sure that's true. Uh, just a quick note, next time um, we'll be covering traceability and also standards. Uh, and I want to mention just briefly here that, uh, uh, that it is possible to sign up for those. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Luca. Hey, thank you very much, Bob. It looks like the timing is just about right. Uh, we did get a few questions already. For those who may be a little bit in a hurry and uh, are going to rush out of the call, which I hope are not going to be many of you, there was going to be a short survey, a little questionnaire to help us understanding how did we do in this web seminar, if the topics was of interest, and if we are encouraged to do uh, more of these, or if we should be thinking about making some changes. For those who are staying, so let me pick up some of the questions that we have already got through the chat line. So thanks uh, to those who have uh, been submitting those. Um, so there's one here about, you know, from Graham. Thanks for thanks for sending it along. So, do the mobile cal labs in trucks 
have the capability to test and calibrate to the full specifications in the same way as sending it back to the country uh, laboratory. So can our on-site calibrations have the same capabilities as return to Agilent Labs? Bob? I'm sorry, I was on mute. Um, <laughs> so first of all, thank you very much for that excellent question. Um, yeah, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, what we do is we use the exact same equipment uh, when we send it out to a mobile location. It's, in many cases, the same technicians who do them in the static locations. And we are always using measurement, automated measurement procedures, which are uh, from the same server that we would have used. So it's the same measurements, the same people, and the, the, uh, everything's the same. So yes, we get we get exactly the same answer. And can I just add the advantage for customers to actually have this service done on site, which implies no costs and risks of shipping, a very limited downtime. So instead of getting things sent, worked, and returned, we actually do it in a matter of uh, you know just the time that it takes to do the calibration. So it is definitely our premium service for calibration, the one that customers choose to have on site. Um, another question is, can Bob address the issue of when standards do not exist in the country? How does Agilent address this? When standards do not exist within a country. Um, That's a good question. You made me think. Um, what, what we do at Agilent, um, there is a, uh, a small council of the top metrologists. Uh, so I'll just mention there's one in, there's uh, Mike Hutchins in, in the UK and another gentleman by the name of Frank Beidert in Deutschland. And what we do is we consult. So uh, what we at Agilent try to do is we try to meet all the standards which are published. So even if in a particular country you're not demanding ISO 17025, that is one of the top uh, calibration standards. And we will follow ISO 17025 whether that's called out for in a particular country or not. And we will follow all of the other standards. And we spend a significant amount of time at Agilent studying all of the standards uh, and the key requirements so that we know that we can meet all of them um, essentially anywhere in the world uh, so that we don't have to worry about it and also so that as a customer neither do you. Thank you. Uh, here's another one that actually follows on a comment that from another participant. So the question is from David, if an instrument passes all tests but is only just in specification, would it be adjusted? Why are instruments not always adjusted so they are as accurate as possible? And there was actually a comment from Jason saying that for some family of instruments, such as the, uh, some of the multimeter function generators, like the 33250A and the DMMs, like the 34401, there is actually always some adjustments performed so that specifications are always centered. So what is the criteria? When do we always do adjustments versus only when it's out of specs? So there's two questions there. Did you want me to just really respond to the second one or what? Well, or, or I, the, 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 the first one is the one that's actually been asked. So what do we do when we're close to the, close to the specification? Do we adjust or not? Okay. Actually, sorry, Luca, um, because I, I am going to answer both. <laughs> um, All right. Uh, the, when, when an instrument is close to a specification, and we know that that block diagram is one of the ones which tends to drift and very likely could before the next specification or be, you know, before the next recommended Cal interval could very likely be out, then we will adjust it. Certain voltmeters, et cetera, uh, are not synthesized, et cetera, in, internal to their block diagram. And those are designated as adjust always. But many of our newer instruments with synthesized local oscillators, digital IFs, et cetera, they don't really drift very much. Uh, and they, when they do drift, they drift slowly. So it's a little bit of a practical consideration. Um, 
many times when I'm asked that question, it's by someone who is buying calibration service from another third party who has no adjustment capability in the first place, may or may not even be measuring all of the tests, but charges a, a much lower price. And then a person will say to me, well, now how come you don't always do that? And I have to tell them that uh, it's just a practical consideration. So what we've done is um, we, we give people the choice of which limit we will make available. So you can either select the limit uh, of the specification or if you want it to be tighter, you can uh, select guard banding or the accredited cal, in which case we use a tighter limit. So we do provide people with a choice. Thank you for watching this Agilent Technologies webcast. For more recorded webcasts, subscribe to our Agilent PM webcast YouTube channel. Remember, all our webcasts are held live. Interact with our Agilent experts in the live Q&A sessions and gain access to Agilent materials. To view our upcoming live webcast and to sign up for free, go to our website, www.agilent.com slash find slash web underscore seminars. <laughs>